Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. I'm Dan alongside Matt once again, and we return for the 100th and 118th episode of Fireside Chat, and this is our pre-draft episode. We haven't been recording since the playoffs started, so it's nice to be back on the air. How are you doing, Matt? Good. It's been a good few weeks for me, and hopefully things get back to normal and we can start talking Flames hockey again for a little while before the summer break. Well, this is our pre-draft episode, so we'll get to talking about the draft picks. But before we do, let's talk about some Flames and Flames-related news. Uh, it's June 10th as we record this, and the big news today is the passing of Mr. Hockey, Gordie Howe, who passed away at the age of 88. Uh, we all know that Gordie had a stroke in October of 2014, and it left him unable to walk. But you know what? This is a sad passing. I mean, you know, he's he's definitely getting older. But I don't know, he's, I mean, Gordy Howe was still that living legend of hockey, and now we've lost another great piece of this game. Yeah, it seems like 2016 has just been a rough year, regardless of what field that you're looking at, whether it's musicians, actors, Muhammad Ali passing a week ago. Hey, just lots of really good quality people out there are just passing away it just seems to be unusual the amount this year though yeah it does um to me i don't know gordy how is still the i guess the surviving piece of the wha when i think back and you know i guess now that's gone but you know there's there's heroes and there's legends heroes get remembered and legends never die and i think we would all say that gordy howe is is a legend in the sport and we still see his influence in the game. I mean, you still have the Gordie Howe hat trick that we talk about. So I don't think that Gordie Howe's memory is going to fade anytime soon. No. And one thing that I do hope is with the Detroit Red Wings moving into a new arena, instead of calling it the Little Caesars Arena or whatever they are, that they should do what they did with the Joe Louis Arena, who is, of course, a legend in the boxing world. They should name it the Gordy Howe Arena. Yeah, I think that's going to be tough in 2016 just from a corporate marketing standpoint, but maybe you could have like a Gordy Howe statue out front or something like that. Well, I would expect that the NHL will probably rename a trophy or something in his name. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they do going forward. Definitely a titan of the sport. On a happier note, um, looking back at what's happened since we broadcast, Team Canada won the World Hockey Championships this summer, and the Flames GM, Brad Treliving, was one of the co-GMs of that team. So it's good to see that for a guy who's in his first GM job, he's already getting that national recognition, and that Canada was able to win gold on a team that he helped put together. Yeah, at any time that you can... Add to your resume uh, of quality results. That's always a good thing. And with how dedicated he has been to trying to improve the Flames, I'm sure that will begin to pay dividends soon. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, the Flames, moving on to the actual Calgary Flames news. The Flames have two signings so far in the summer. We haven't even you know, made it to free agent season, if you will. And the Flames have signed two European players. The first one was Daniel Preble, and the second one is David Riddich. A little bit about each guy. Um, both Czech players, so it sounds like we're snapping up all of the Czech free agents. Preble is a 23-year-old center and winger. He's six foot three. 238 pounds um he's been playing in czech republic pretty much his whole career and last year he had a a 45 point season i'm not sure how that compares over there but that's one of the top totals in the entire league isn't okay i think he was second only behind roman trevenka oh wow so pretty good so the analysis of this guy is hockey future.com hockey's future.com put it it says he's a bit of a late riser but preble is a work in progress whose height long reach and soft hands make him a capable goal scorer despite that height he's not an overly physical player 
and he's not yet demonstrated the ability to consistently battle in small areas. As with many players' his height, his skating balance and overall agility are issues, but should improve as he matures. His positional play is also a bit of an unknown at this point, but coaches who've worked with him have complimented his work ethic and determination to improve. And to me, those last two are so important coming into the Flames. We know that this team is building itself around work ethic, and having a guy like that I think is going to be great for the Flames. Yeah, one thing to note with each of these players is that they both had a breakout year this season, and it, it seems that the Flames are more willing to try to see if they are catching lightning in a bottle, and having a player that is showing a lot of offensive potential in Preble's case and solid goaltending in Rich, Riddich's place, so maybe that they might be able to get quality NHL caliber talent for just a free agent signing. Yeah, and I mean, it can hurt. We've seen the Flames go over to Europe a lot for signings. You mentioned Shervanka, you know, we've had uh, Wolf, we've had Nakladal. So we've seen the Flames take this, this journey to find players a few times. Uh, the second player we mentioned, David Riddich, is a goaltender. 23 years old. He's six foot four and 194 pounds. He again's played in Czech his whole career, and uh, pretty good stats. Again, I don't know how they confirm how uh, they... they're the fourth best stats of any starting goaltender, and one of the guys ahead of him is 28, so more of a veteran guy, and another one's a really short goaltender, like five foot ten, five foot eleven. Okay. So not really translatable so it again one of the top performers in that league so i don't some potential i don't see riddich being any more look just looking at our depth chart than an ahl backup how about you uh pretty much the same if uh, gillies is going to be the starter yeah i think like more or less it's taking a shot in the dark like the flames did when they acquired red obara just uh, a big goaltender, there's probably some flashes of skill that there might be something there. If the guy pans out and becomes either an NHL backup or starter, it's found money. If not, at least you've got a quality farmhand that can play 20 games in Stockton. What do you think this means for Kevin Poulon as a flame? I think that they were concerned about his injury troubles and his knee specifically because that's been a recurring problem with Poulon. I don't think that he'll be back. So you think that Riddich pretty much takes his place? Pretty much. And on a two-year one-way deal, I mean, I think we're all assuming that Gillies comes up now as the... Uh, one-year two-way. Yeah, oh, one backwards. year. Sorry, yeah, one-year two-way. That's what I meant to say. A one-year, two-way deal. I think we all assume that Gillies comes up now as the starting goalie in the AHL. So, I mean, Riddich would be at least fourth on the depth chart there. I don't see this guy getting a call up any time next year, but you can't go wrong on a one-year deal. I mean, you got to find a veteran goalie from somewhere to back up a rookie. This is, to me, as good as any, I guess. Yeah, and even the player himself said that he doesn't expect to play in Calgary unless he takes a few steps forward. So uh, if he does figure something out during the summer and comes in and steals a spot, that would be certainly a surprise. But it would be very unexpected. Yeah. And you never know. He might play so well in the AHL that he'll earn another contract and might push his way in, in the year after. Well, and, and that's the thing is if you can play somebody else out of a job, if you can play John Gillies out of a job, more power to you. Yeah, you know, I don't want to think that well. Gillies is the heir apparent, so he has to be number one. If you can take his job, then you become the new heir apparent. Good. Yeah, exactly, and like that's why when it comes to the draft, the Flames should continue to add another goaltender this year through the draft, just to keep that system churning until the Flames do find a, a Jonathan Quick or a Tuka Rask or whatever. Just like a top-tier starting goaltender. Yeah, every team needs one, and I mean, they're hard to find, but when you find one, you got to hang on to them for a, for a long time. So, Matt, other Flames news? I guess the biggest story since we last broadcast was the dismissal of the Flames head coach, Bob Hartley, and assistant coach, 
uh, Jacques Cloutier, who went with him. I don't know about you. When I read this, I was shocked by this news. I did not expect Hartley to lose his job this year. How about you? No. And, well, you and I both said at the end of the season that, like, see how he does again next year, and if the, there's they run into a wall, then maybe you replace them then. Obviously, the Flames were just wanting to change entirely, which isn't a bad thing. Especially, you got to figure that the Flames now are going more into we want to be a contender type team, not having the same problems that the team has had each of the last two seasons, especially with their lack of defensive ability. Because the team on the whole should be better defensively than they have been. Yeah. And yeah, I, they I think be. that the new coach will be putting more of a system in where you'll see, like, because a lot of the Flames offense was generated from long stretch passes and anybody who knows what they're doing coaching wise can devise a system to shut that down. And I think that now the Flames will likely end up playing a system that's more structured instead. Yeah, when I first heard this news, I wondered to myself how much of this might have to do with our two uh, RFAs, Sean Monaghan and Johnny Goudreau. Um, I don't know if maybe there's some hard feelings there and they wanted them fired. I hope that the team isn't running based on what players want. But, you know, I agree with you about being a structured system. I'm just not sure that this was really the time to fire Hartley. I think that, I mean, we saw a pretty structured system from Hartley in his first year here, but... Special teams have been atrocious both years. I think you could have fixed that by bringing in a special teams coach. So, I don't know. I just, I guess I'm surprised that he's gone, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure what better looks like is, I guess, what I'm trying to define in my own mind. Yeah. Well, back when Bob Hartley was a candidate to be hired in the first place, I remember uh, being asked at one point, uh, what type of coach, like who the candidate should be. And I didn't really have an answer at that point. And the Flames at that time, they needed somebody that could get the best out of each of the players, like especially like a guy like Jay Bomeister wasn't being used correctly under Brent Sutter. And like Hartley continued that with all of the current Flames. And, like, that's why you've seen seasons like uh, Giordano and Brody, how they've been scoring a lot more because he was allowing them to utilize their assets and being able to jump into the play whenever they want. Now I think that the Flames have players that you can expect a guy like Giordano to be able to jump into the play. I think this team needs to have a system in place where there's less of a gap between the forwards and the defensemen and there's more emphasis on cutting down the other team being able to do anything in the offensive zone because especially last year the Flames got running around in their own zone for extended periods of time and just couldn't figure out a way to stop that. So... The Flames have a lot of good parts in this team. I don't know. Randy Carlisle and Travis Green are two of the candidates that have been interviewed multiple times, and I honestly wouldn't be able to tell you which is better based on not being in the room to see what their philosophies are. The Flames do need to play more structured overall instead of like leaving the zone to get passes and all that kind of stuff. The thing that I guess worries me is in the first year we saw Hartley here, he was really living that always earned, never given mentality that they put out there. We saw them bringing the kids up and giving the kids play time and, you know, guys being sat who weren't good on the ice. And last year we didn't see that. I mean, we saw Mason Raymond getting more rope than he should have. I'd say that we saw Bowley getting more rope than he should have. So I don't know what the change between 
Hartley in the summer was, what he changed there. But whatever it was, it was for the worse. And I guess if I imagine management talked about that in the exit meetings, and if Hartley wasn't going to be doing that, then I think it's right to let him go. Yeah. Well, I think part of the reason, because the Flames had such success in uh, 2014, 2015, that they... I think what happened was that they raised their own expectations that, okay, now we're a playoff team instead of we're a team that's only like three years into a rebuild. So, and that's why I think you saw the more reliance on guys like Matt Stajan, Brandon Bullig, Mason Raymond, all of which should not have been in the lineup if the Flames were playing like being coached in the same manner that they were when they did have that success. Yeah. So I don't know what changed with Hartley between the two seasons. I think it was just more trying to put the best lineup out there period and relying on veterans, expecting them to perform. And those veterans happened to regress last year to such a significant, uh, amount that it pretty much screwed the flames over. Because as you saw at the end of the season, once we started bringing in the kids, guys like Shin Carrick, Hathaway, and all that, the team started to play a lot better. And the Flames only finished a handful of points out of a playoff spot, where if they had want, gone 500 in October, they probably would have been in a playoff spot. It's frustrating, but... Unfortunately, the Flames are saddled with a few contracts that are absolutely horrid, and again, we're kind of stuck for next season as well. Well, but the contracts and the coaching are different, right? We we have to True. separate that out. The True. contracts are Tre Living's job. The coaching of the team on the ice is Hartley's job. Yes. Oh, for sure. You mentioned that Travis Green was one of the guys that's been interviewed. For those that don't know, he's 45. He's a former NHL player who played for the Islanders, the Ducks, the Coyotes, the Leafs, and the Bruins. He's currently the head coach of the AHL's Utica Comets and seen by a lot of people as one of the better, if not the best, currently unemployed NHL or currently unemployed in the NHL coaches. Um, the other guy that Matt mentioned, Randy Carlisle, to me, I'm not sure that right now what the Flames need is Randy Carlisle. I'd be willing to take a chance on a younger coach like Green. I'm just not sure that with the Flames trying to still rebuild this team, Carlisle's the right coach. Yeah. I think if the Flames were like a guaranteed playoff team and they had fired Hartley, then Carlisle would make sense. I I just don't think because I think the Flames are gonna have a hard time again next year due to the fact that over ten million dollars is tied up in players that are not useful to an NHL team. That it's gonna be hard with that handicap to be able to figure out how to be a playoff team unless you're just basically sending those teams players to the farm and just running with younger players in their place yeah i'm and i mean you know to give him credit hartley was not known as a young players coach when we hired him he was known True. as a veterans coach so we weren't sure how that was going to go so and it did work really well the two years that uh, under the rebuild in 13 14 and 14 15 it's just he relied too much on veterans last year much to the detriment of the team to me, if you're going to bring Carlisle in as the head coach, you bring a guy like Travis Green in to be the associate coach, sort of the obvious heir apparent. Very True. similar to when the Flames had Daryl Sutter as the GM and they brought in Jay Feaster as the assistant GM. It was kind of known that as soon as Sutter was out, Feaster would take over. And I think Carlisle might be a good guy to be here for a year or two. I can't see him being a long-term choice. But I could see somebody like that mentoring Travis Green. Or you go the other way, as we saw in Ottawa, where you bring in the less experienced coach and you make Carlisle the associate coach. And I can agree with that, too. Uh, um, it just depends on if you're able to sign them on, and get them to agree to those terms. Yeah, and, and I think that the Flames, if you listen to what Burke has always said, 
Burke has always said that he's he's trying to build something bigger here. He's trying to build a team, and you know you have to believe in the team vision, and that's what he said even when he came in as the president. And I think that Brian can be pretty compelling, and he has some history with Carlisle, um, you know, as far as being around the league together and that sort of thing. But yeah, well, and he, if I recall, he hired him in Toronto. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. Like they've worked together, but they've also seen each other as opposition as well. Um, so I could see Burke being the guy that could convince this to happen. Yeah. And he kind of won a Stanley Cup with them in Anaheim. So, but, Yeah, I, my preference if it was going to go with those two would be Green as the head coach and Carlisle as the associate. Yeah, sort of like what Pittsburgh has with uh, Jacques Martin being the assistant coach and Mike Sullivan being the head coach. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's one of those things, though, that it's hard to say, oh, well, this coach is obviously better than that one when you're not in the actual room because you don't know the exact specifics of what their philosophy is for this team. And that's why it's hard to say, oh, well, I specifically want this guy over another guy because you just don't know what their thinking is on how to approach things. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm not really committing to saying, oh, the Flames should go get Carlisle or Green or Galutzen or any of the other guys that have been rumored. Well, I mean, there's a lot of names, and I think in some ways, yes, the coach has a philosophy, but the coach also has to follow a team's philosophy. Yeah, uh, coach, exactly. Uh, and that, that's why, like, that meshing of the team philosophy and the coach's philosophy. Because, mm -hmm. like, especially the last time uh, the Flames replaced the coach, Sutter was very much a systems-oriented guy and didn't really care too much about the specific skills of the player. And, like, guys like Bo Meester and Nick Hagman were not used correctly under Sutter uh because Hagman was a good penalty killer that was not used on the penalty kill and Bo Meester used to jump into the play to score goals and wasn't used in that manner. Mm -hmm. So it, the Flames at that time needed a coach that would allow the players to utilize their actual skill sets. Now the Flames are on the opposite end of that problem where they've been utilizing their skill sets without really having a good system in place. Yeah, I think we need a coach that's going to, I hate to say it, but teach the basics. Yes, these guys are NHL players and they should know that, but we need these guys to be playing a full 60-minute game of hockey. In yeah. the offensive zone, the neutral zone, the defensive zone, and the special teams. And I think that in the past we've seen some breakdowns in the defensive end and on the special teams. And we need a guy who, as much as he understands each unique player and what they bring, um, you know, he also knows how to take this unit and make it work and function as one unit well, like as well. An example of a problem that the Flames had is that they, the defensemen, when they would get the puck in the defensive zone, sometimes, like especially if you've been hemmed in, the easiest thing to do is just lift the puck and get it out of the zone. Uh, just dump it in the air and, you know, get off if you can, or at least ease the pressure. But instead, the Flames, a lot of the time, the defensemen, even if it was Smead or England or Naclaudel or whatever, they would be looking for outlet passes in that, and sometimes that would lead to turnovers and exacerbating the problem. And that lack of being able to be flexible and not do the typical breakouts and just relieving the pressure the flames haven't been really doing that under hartley and that especially when you're running around and are tired you just need a breather like it's not icing the puck just getting it out of the zone sometimes that's just the best course of action even if you're only able to change one or two of the forwards even and that lack of flexibility in being able to do different things at different times in the game caused a lot of problems well and if you if you think back to Harley at least for me when I've been thinking about this since the dismissal 
Bob Hartley, his sort of strategy for dealing with, I wouldn't want to say problems, but adversity during a game was switch up the lines. And I can't think, if I think back, I can't think of what Bob Hartley's actual on-ice strategy was. Like, there didn't ever seem to be a lot of cohesive strategy or set plays or anything like that. And I think... Yeah, well, like, especially, like, in certain games, uh, uh, two of them that I recall clearly in December, uh, one was against the New York Rangers and once was against the Anaheim Ducks. And each of those teams realized that the Flames were doing the stretch passes, so they were just getting their sticks in the way of the puck, knocking it down, and then just chipping it back up the ice towards the flame zone. And they just did that all game. And, like, after the first period, if you're noticing that the team's stopping the way that you're trying to generate offense, you would think that there would be adjustments to those that way of playing and try to, like, carry the puck up instead. And the Flames didn't really make any adjustments in those games. Like, that Anaheim game was the one that we went to right after Christmas that was a one nothing game on a goal by Sean Horkoff and like it, that was like a painfully boring game because the Flames weren't able to do a damn thing in that game because they just kept attempting to do the same things over and over and over again for 60 minutes and the Ducks would just shut that down and it always seemed to me at least when I was watching them that the adjustments the players would make on the ice or the plays they'd make on the ice if you will um, they were always like it almost seemed like they were done by the players. It always seemed like it was just the player who, you know, said, "Hey, let's try something," or "Hey, let's do this." And you know, it ne- yeah, it never seemed like there was this coordinated effort of, "Okay, guys, this is the play. Let's do X." Yeah, well, like if you're looking at the Pittsburgh Penguins uh, earlier this season, before they fired their coach, um, the players on the ice would not be talking with each other. And they would just be following the system, and it wasn't working, obviously, and they fired the coach. And the team made the adjustment, and, like, getting Crosby to talk with Hornquist and his other line mates to draw up plays at the time, if they're, you know, like, if we win the face-off and the puck goes here, do this or that, or, you know, like, pass it over here, or take the shot, or whatever. And that kind of communication the flames didn't really do that much at any point you very rarely saw the players actually talking with each other on the ice to design plays on the go it was all just okay this is what the coach wants us to do we're doing it and that's it which i don't always think is a bad thing if the coach has said plays and you do them but i think it's about being smart and i think a team has to have some set plays some set strategies at least not necessarily a whole play but I think that the, the team has to have some strategies of this is what each guy's role is on the ice. Here's sort of what they're going to do. And be flexible. Yeah, and then the team has to be able to go in and of itself and say, this isn't working. Now we have to get creative. Yeah, plan B. Yeah. And the Flames didn't have a plan B at any point this season. And it was just... Like, the amount of talent that the Flames have, they should be a playoff team. Like, when you have a player like Gaudreau and a player like Monaghan and three defensemen that are top-notch, you should be in the playoffs regardless of how bad the rest of your team is. Mm -hmm. And the lack of flexibility and ability to try different things is one of the reasons why the Flames are picking sixth overall. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, it's not what I would have done, this whole Hartley thing, but I think, I don't think you can go wrong with it at this point. Like, I don't think we can get a coach that's going to make this team worse. I think that if they are going to change coaches, maybe it's better that they did it this year as opposed to end of next year. Yeah, because then there would be more expectations of being a top-tier team at that point. Yeah, well, you're getting further up that curve of a rebuild. Exactly. You know, and I, and yeah, like even you if, should be vying for not just the playoffs, but the division and possibly the cup at that point. Yeah, I don't know if I quite agree they should be vying for the playoffs yet, but I think that by that point, you've sort of established a system of how you want these guys to play going forward. And 
by that point, it's going to be like, okay, if we switch the system now, we could send things back a year. You know, we could almost have the players. It's like, okay, they, you know, they are now changing system. These are young guys. What are we going to do? What's going to happen now? Um, Yeah. You know, as these guys now have to relearn a new system. Yeah. Sometimes a new coach just doesn't fit with that particular group of players as well. And that has happened. So that also depends. And like next year is kind of a transition year because of the amount of contracts that are ending. So the flames are able, like if things do screw up with the new coach, there's that flexibility of being able to make a change on the fly without it really. I don't think that you switch coaches after one year. No, but like if things like say the flames start like one and 10 or something like that, maybe you just decide, okay, we made a mistake with our hire. And I think it's going to be tough to hire somebody else. If you fire the guy 11 games in true, but it, really if like everything goes wrong (laughs) it can't happen it has in the past yeah and i would also i mean we can have that discussion at the time but i would also question at that point if it's the coach or if it's young players adjusting to a new system true it's one of those situations that you don't know until you get there Mm -hmm. and hopefully things go smoothly so that way it's not even a concern (laughs) yeah for sure for sure that would uh that make w- things a lot easier. That would make things easier, yeah. If if we can just get a coach, get him in, get a new system going, that's what we need at this point. And I hope the Flames aren't in a rush to get that coach. I mean, you don't need a coach for the draft. I would rather they take longer and get the right guy. Yep, then you're not necessarily going to be finding the right guy right now either because teams are going to be firing coaches and all that in the off season yeah you wait till july 1st when you know contracts expire guys will probably be you know let go by then that sort of thing well should we turn our attention to the draft matt yes the Um, fun thing that we'll be looking forward to in two weeks from today the playoffs of are winding down we've got the draft coming up and it's a big draft year for the flames this year the flames have 10 picks in the draft as it sits right now on june 10th so i'll run those down for you guys as well as some conditions um, nine on picks. those picks i'm pretty sure we have 10 uh oh yeah my mistake counted yeah, wrong never picks. mind so we have our first round pick which will be the sixth overall selection that was our pick that belonged to us we have the second round pick which will likely be 35th overall which is our pick no it is 35th Oh, right, yeah, because that's already been decided. We also have the second-round pick at 54th, which is Florida's pick that we acquired in the Hoodler deal. We have a second-round pick from Dallas, which will be 56 overall. That's in the Russell deal. I really wish that turned into a first, but it didn't. We have our third-round pick at 66th overall and our fourth-round pick at 96th overall. We could have had another fourth-round pick from Nashville in the in the Reinhardt trade, but the conditions on that were never met. I would imagine it had to do with Reinhardt playing X number of NHL games. Uh, we have our own fifth round pick at 126. We have our own sixth round pick at 156. We have our own sixth round pick at 166, which we got from, or sorry, we have Minnesota's sixth round pick at 166, which we acquired in the Jones trade. And we have our seventh overall pick at 186th overall. This was supposed to have gone to Colorado in the Freddie Hamilton trade, but the conditions were never met, so we got our own pick back. Yeah, and speaking of the Jones trade, Nicholas Backstrom signed on with the team in Finland, so congrats to him for getting another job. Yeah, I don't think that he's the right guy to be here next year, but I'm glad that he's still getting work because I think that he's still got some... I think he's still got some play left in him. Yeah, and... Thank you for your service as a member of the Flames for those few games, and best of luck in uh, HIFK, I think, was the team they signed with. So hopefully has a good season for them next year, and all the best to them. So, Matt, we've got uh, six, well, 
We've got the sixth overall pick, but we have nine others this year. The first round's the one that people always look at. But overall, you've been doing our draft previews on the site. What are your thoughts of this year's draft year? Uh, it's a weird year. Um, the first 20 players or so are pretty good. Uh, I would say that it's more or less comparable to last year or the year before. There are different positions, of course. Like Now there's two big right-wingers that are going in the top three. Other than that, though, like once you hit around the 20 mark, you're running into a bit of a strange spot where a lot of the players that are rated from like 20 to 70 are either really big players that are projects that will take four or five years, like a Joe Colborn, uh, and they might not pan out. And then you have other guys that are very skilled but are also like five foot eight, five foot nine, it, both as forwards and defensemen, which is shocking. Not too many times do you see defensemen being rated in the top 50 that are under six feet tall, but there's three or four of them this time. And very few players that are just average sized with skill. So it's kind of like you're either getting giants or short players, and there's not really much in between. And the goaltenders this year are kind of below average as well. Guys that normally would be drafted in the third or fourth round are like the best guys available. So Interesting. Yeah. You know, and we see ebbs and flows. And I mean, you know, last year I was seen as a pretty good draft year overall. And generally after a good draft year, we tend to have a poor draft year. Yeah, and this is no different. It, last year was pretty much the best draft since 2003 in terms of quality and depth in the draft. Not so much at the top end of the draft, but like just for like getting a guy like Anderson and Shillington at the end of the second round, like those guys are normally mid to late first round picks. Well, that's it. And the fact that we could trade our first, you know, our first couple picks and still end up with that kind of talent, that was a sign, I think, of how deep that draft was. Yeah. So, and that's why, like, I don't really criticize Boston for going nuts and getting a whole whack of picks because they did very well with those players and it will be beneficial to them long term, even though. They look a little strange for doing what they did. Yeah, for sure. Well, Matt, um, looking at the picks, let's just start on our list here. We have the sixth overall pick this year, and the Flames website, Tori Peterson, posted an interesting article looking at the success of the sixth overall pick in the past four or five years. And if you look, four of the last five players drafted at sixth overall have played at least one full NHL season. And last year's pick made his debut in the season he was drafted. Three of those five have taken on big roles with their clubs, um, and Jake Vertanen is poised to lead his team in the future. So let's look at the last couple that we've had. And in 2011, Mika Zabinajad was the sixth overall pick, I think a, a good player there, uh, center with Ottawa, a guy that you know I think any team would like to have. 2012 was Hampus Lindholm, the defenseman for the Ducks, again, a great young defenseman. 2013, Sean Monahan. He's okay. <laughs> There's the one guy on the list that no one's ever heard of. Yeah. Um, and again, a, a guy that's taken a big role with this team. Uh, 2012, Jake Vertanen, the right winger for the Canucks. And 2015 was Pavel Zacha uh, of the Devils. So, you know, at the six, w they often spend a lot of time on hockey media sites focused on the top three the top three, but this shows that we've had in the last, you know, five years, great picks at that sixth overall spot. Yeah. And this is also the fifth time that the Calgary Flames have drafted sixth overall. The first one was Corey Stillman, fairly decent player. Then two not so good picks with Rico Fada and Daniel Kachuk. And then of course that so-so player, Sean Monaghan. So, yeah, Two good ones, two not-so-good ones. Hopefully, this one's another good one for the Flames. For sure. For sure. That's all we can hope. And, I mean, you know, the again, this year we've talked about the top players. 
You know, there's been a lot of talk of the top three. And I still think there's some good talent available at number six. Um, before we get looking at that talent, though, you pose an interesting question here. There's been talk that the Columbus Blue Jackets might be willing to make the number three pick available, the third overall pick in this year's entry draft. Yeah, and this is mainly due to the fact that uh, selling a Finnish guy in Columbus in terms of advertising is kind of tough. And especially there are a couple of big centers that are available in the 5-6 range with uh, both um, Pierre-Luc Dubois and Logan Brown. And those guys are more sellable in that market. And they do need a first-line center. They have a lot of decent second and third line options but no clear-cut number one center in their organization so it does make some sense for them to trade down and i think that even trading down as long as they're in the top 10 i think columbus will still get something that they could use there yeah you know i, I don't see them dropping too far but matt you'd pose the question if number three is available um, and the Flames decide, I mean, you have to look at it if it is, but the Flames decide they want to move on it. What should the Flames make available to try and get the number three spot? What would that trade look like? Do you have any thoughts there? Well, Columbus is kind of in a weird position where they're rebuilding, and yet they're not far away from contending for a playoff spot either. And they have a couple of really terrible contracts on the books. Uh, Scott Hartnell's making four and a half million for two years. Uh, Clarkson's making like over five million dollars for like four years, which I don't think that one's going anywhere. And uh, Sergey Bobrovsky is making seven point five million for three seasons. Now um, the Blue Jackets do have a pair of goaltenders that are NHL ready. Uh, between uh, Jonas Corposalo and Anton Forsberg. They also have Curtis McElhaney. Yeah, so they could hypothetically move Bobrovsky just to get rid of his contract and go with cheaper options for the time being. Because they are kind of in rebuild mode, but not. And with Bobrovsky being injured most of the time the last two seasons, they might be willing to include him in that trade just to get rid of the contract which would make some sense whether it's Hartnell or Bobrovsky because Hartnell's a right winger it would either option would make sense in a positional way for the Flames while taking on a supposed bad contract to make sense for Columbus yeah, to me, I don't know. I think that there's probably value in. Um, I think there's probably value in Bobrovsky going forward. I think that you could sell. Seven million is not that bad for a starting goalie. I think that you could sell that fairly easily um, to the right buyer. I don't know that I would throw that in just to move down in a draft and get rid of the contract. Um, but, yeah, I could see maybe Hartnell being thrown in there. Now, I don't know if I'd want the Flames to take on a contract as big as Hartnell's. Yeah, and that's where it gets... That's the only thing. With two big contracts coming yeah. up, I'm not sure that I want us... At this point, if we didn't have the uh, the goudreau Monahan contracts being renewed and they still had one more year, sure. But the way it looks now, I'm I'm just not sure I want to take on a big contract. When we're trying to shed some, we're going to be trying to shed the staging and the wide men and that. And I don't think you can say, oh, we want to shed these ones, but it's okay to take on yeah. one more bad one. And that's where it, it's a little dicey. And like realistically, the Flames could trade a number of assets to, in addition to that just to make it a straight hockey trade, whether it's a guy like Colborne or Backland or any of the prospects like Poirier, Klimchuk, Shinkarik, one of the defensemen, like there's options available. I don't see, like outside of the key players that the Flames would protect in the draft, uh, the expansion draft, I don't see anybody else being that important where they couldn't be included in a trade to move up to number three if it's available. It just would depend on what the no, ask is. I, 
Well, I know you usually say it depends here, but if you were that GM or you were to speculate on what the GM is going to have to give up, what do you think the Flames would have to give up to move up three spots? I would expect at the very minimum one of Colborne or Backland and number 35 and probably one of the good prospects. So by number 35, you mean the second one of our second round picks? Yes, and... Uh, a guy like a Poirier, a Klimchuk, a Shankarik, a Hickey, one of those caliber of prospects in addition to that for number three. Yeah, I think you're about on there. I think they would probably want Backlund over Colborne. Um, Backlund at a... It depends because Colborne can play right wing and center, so they might like that flexibility more because they're about the same age too, so... And they'll have roughly the same contract, so it depends on what they're specifically looking Backlund's for. Backlund's got two more years at 3.5. Colborne's an RFA. We're not sure what he gets. I think he's going to get a lot less than Backlund. Um, yeah, I'm thinking in the 3-3.5 three to three and a half area. I think that'd be very generous for Joel Colborne. I'm thinking like 2-2.5. Yeah. to 2. 5. Especially on a year where we got a lot of money being tied up in two guys. Yeah, well, that's again if we're re-signing them. If another team acquires them in trade, that's a different situation. And you know, based on that, that ask, I'm not sure I'd be willing to move up. I would. You would? Without even a, a second thought. You think? Honestly, you think it's, worth, like, you think it's uh, that worth it? Yeah. Uh, getting a six foot four, two hundred and twenty five pound right winger who's fast and can stick handle like Pooley RV can, and has that shot, yeah, <laughs> easily. I'd even add on top of that. I might even be willing to throw in next year's first round pick. That's how much I think that there's that much of a difference between the player at six and the player at wow. three. So. Interesting. So, so you're you're thinking that if that number three pick is available, we should really go hard to try and acquire it. As hard out as the Flames did to get Hamilton, if not more so. And I think that because this draft is seen as being so top heavy, I think there's going to be a lot of teams that would be kicking tires at number three, and I think the Flames have to make sure they don't get caught up in the momentum of that. Yeah, but realistically, like. The Oilers, they don't need another winger. Like, it's not a desperate need for them. And Vancouver has so many areas of weakness that, like, they could go and get him, but they don't have the quality and the amount of assets in their organization that would be necessary to do so. And then if you're looking for pick 7 through say 10 they're going to have to add even more than the Flames would in order to bridge that gap because there is a difference between each of those picks successively so like I could see a team say Buffalo or Montreal being able to do it it's just it would cost even more than what it would cost the Flames yeah that's so, that's a good point for the most realistic option, I think the Flames are in that best option because the Flames do have a ton of depth, both at the NHL and AHL. Well, I'd say we definitely, if we want to, we have the pieces that would probably be required to make that move. We yeah. would, we would be able just, to still keep our centerpiece forwards in Goudreau Monahan and our three centerpiece defensemen in Giordano, Hamilton, and Brody. I think we could get off without any of those five moving. I wouldn't move any of those five for that pick anyways. Or even Bennett either. True. Yeah, Bennett, you don't want to move either. So I think if we look at those six as our centerpieces, I think everybody else in this team around those guys can be moved for the right price. And Maybe this is the right price. Yeah. Because especially like getting a first-line right winger, which I honestly would expect Puglia Yarvi to step in, play on the first line next year. That's how... Uh, bullish I am on that if Columbus decides to make him available and it would be a good complementary both in terms of size and skill to Goudreau on the opposite end of the height scale so if 
Columbus makes it available, they should pretty much go all out to make it happen. That said, I think the odds of that happening are still very slim. I don't see Columbus going out of their way to do it, even if they're not necessarily wanting Pugliarv. So, yeah, no, I think that Columbus has a lot to gain by trading down. I think if if we look at the top four teams, they're the one team that can trade down and still have a good first round. Um, yeah. Like you said, they're they got some interesting things going on there. Yeah, and this draft realistically, it, the. One through five are pretty much what you would expect one through five being. And, like, they're all above, like, six through 14. So, like, I'm expecting Matthews, Lene, Puyarvi, Kachuk, and Dubois being one through five in some order. And beyond that, it's a complete jump ball. So... If the Flames can get one of those top five, the draft is a win. If not, then other options are available. And let's talk about some of those other options. Um, let's assume that we're going to be drafting sixth overall. Let's assume that uh, the Flames are not going to be taking you know one of those top three, and none of them fall. I don't think that there's much chance yeah. of it. One through five. like. Throw Kachuk and Dubois out of the conversation entirely yeah, as well. Yeah, I was going to say top four, but yeah, I'd agree top five. So we, we go up to the podium at number six. You've identified uh, a handful of players here that you think could be targets for the Flames. Let's talk about these guys. First, you, you thought yeah, there might it's be three a weird, small wingers. Yeah, it's weird that there are groupings of similar players. There are three wingers that are all undersized, three defensemen that are all the same height, and a six foot six center in Logan Brown. It's just weird because usually, like all the players af in any draft are kind of like all over the place in terms of height, size, skill level, and all that. And but this year, it's a bit weird that it's like clusters of types of players. So let's talk about those three wingers um, that that you'd mentioned. The first one being Clayton Keller. Keller is a five foot ten winger, um, 170 pounds. He's the same type of player you've said as Johnny Goudreau, but you're saying that the only con is that he's slightly taller than Goudreau. Tell us a bit about this player. Well, I wouldn't really say that's a con. That's just the only difference is that he's slightly taller. Uh, very similar approach to the game as Goudreau. Uh, if you didn't see the name on the back of the jersey, you would have, uh, it, and watching highlights of him or watching him play, it's a very similar guy. Unfortunately, he's also a left winger, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, because if the Flames, so, hypothetically, if they drafted Keller, you'd have Goudreau Monahan and Keller Bennett, which would basically be giving you the same general look on each line. So I don't know if the Flames want to have, like, a repetition in that way, but the Flames would know exactly what they they would be getting in Keller due to the fact that they have basically the same guy in Goudreau. We also, I don't think, need a left winger or a centerman at this point. No, but that said, it, it getting a right winger is possible in different ways, and... Not necessarily through the draft, but via trade. So, like, Keller, he broke a lot of Patrick Kane's scoring records in the same league at the same age. Uh, so, he is a very dynamically skilled player. It's just, unfortunately, his build is very much Gaudreau-like. And it'll probably take him two or three years to get through his development just to reach the NHL but of the three small wingers I think he has the highest upside the highest skill level and is the most dynamic of the three players I also like that he's in the U.S. national development team program I've always found that players who came from the U.S. NTDP I've always seen that they have a good fundamental 
base of hockey. Um, you know, yeah. that, that's a good program. They teach these kids really well. I find the kids that come out of that program tend to be more complete players than a lot of their contemporaries. Yeah, he's a very smart player, very instinctual, just like Gaudreau as well. So uh, it would be pretty much like acquiring a second of the same guy, which with Gaudreau being as good as he is, the option of getting a second one that a player that is similar, in my view, that would be a very good way to go about it because you can always address size and the lack of right wingers in other ways yeah that's true i don't know though that we need two very small um and very goudreau like players that yes goudreau is a good player but i think if you have too many guys from the same cookie cutter your team becomes that much easier to play against true but it all depends and like if the flames can address the size issue like you can get away with having two short players it's just are they that good where we already have a couple short players not really we got rid of everybody under six feet other than Gaudreau so it it would basically be Keller and Gaudreau under six feet okay I guess yeah if you classify six foot as the tall mark I'd say six foot is yeah about average in the NHL but yeah well, for being undersized, okay. that would be it. Like, we got rid of Russell, we got rid of Byron, we got rid of Ham or Hoodler, so there's nobody left. That's true. So, like, if the Flames, say, like, in the UFA market, they got, like, Bacchus or Brower to fill a right-wing spot and acquired somebody of similar size to fill out the other right-wing spot or just threw Colborne over there, you would be fine doing it that way. Like it wouldn't uh, ideally Keller would be like six foot one or Gaudreau for that matter, but then they would probably have been drafted first overall. So, you know, <laughs> makes things a little bit more interesting. For sure. Uh, the next guy on your list is Tyson Yost, a centerman and a left winger. He's also five foot 11. He is uh, 190 pounds. Yost is a crafty goal scorer that carries out plays as quickly as he can envision them. Someone who thinks and plays at a fast tempo, it comes as no surprise that he creates a lot of energy as an offensive catalyst. He sees the ice very well and has the willingness and determination to win battles in tough areas. All in all, a dynamic forward with top six potential. And that came from EliteProspects.com. Um, this yeah. is a guy who has quite a bit of background um this is a guy who has been the ca the captain for the canadian u18 team um he's he's signed up to play in the ncaa next year but he plays in the bchl and we've seen before with guys who are playing in these provincial leagues they often don't get the same level of competition to develop so that's a bit worrisome to me True, but in the U18 team, I do believe he broke the record for most points in that tournament, or was like right up there with the best that ever played in that tournament. So uh, the concerns, I think the BCHL is actually getting a little bit better in terms of reputation due to guys like Brandon Hickey, uh, Jamie Ben, and that was something that we were we were concerned about with Hickey too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, like, if that draft was done again, I think he would have been picked probably around the 20 mark instead of 65th or whatever the Flames took him at. So, uh, you know, it, they're, it's getting better in terms of, like, the players that are actually good in that league are actually turning out to be quality players instead of guys like Chris Chucko before. So... Like, I understand your concern, but I think in this particular case, it's mostly overblown due to his performance in international tournaments. Okay, you could be right there. And for a style and talent comparison, I'd probably go with Joe Pavelski, a guy that will score a lot more so than pass, but is overall a good player. He might stick at center. Like, he's only 5'11", so he may stick at center. In terms of the Flames, he'd probably be a right or a left winger instead. 
just like with Keller. Well, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't want to put him as the third line center behind Bennett and uh, and Monahan. I guess you could move Bennett to the wing. Yeah, but then you're replacing a six foot, six foot one center with a five foot eleven one. Doesn't make a lot no. of sense. And then the uh, the third smaller winger is Alex Nylander, brother of Toronto forward William Nylander. And this is the guy, just for the record, that would be my pick for the Flames at sixth. Yeah, and I, if the Flames walked away with Nylander, I wouldn't really be complaining too much. He's just as talented as his brother. He'll be a top six forward. Good right winger. Not much to complain about. And, you know, maybe this is the Flames homer in me, but I always liked his dad. I thought, you know, at the time when the Flames sucked, his dad was a pretty stable part of this team. Um, you know, if you look at the numbers he put up um, with the Flames, he put up 55 points in 73 games one year. So, you know, not too bad. I mean, he didn't have great seasons, but he was always a steady player yeah, here, I thought. And and he's and and Alex has, I mean, he comes from that pedigree. We've seen this a lot lately with hockey families and pedigree, and these guys doing quite well. And, you know, even with Max Domi, I'd say you didn't, his dad wasn't a star player, but Max is looking great. I think there's something to be said about that pedigree. Yeah. And like, I have no complaints if the Flames decide to go that route. Honestly, if the Flames drafted any of the seven players that we're going to be talking about, I wouldn't really be complaining too much. So, because they're all of them in terms of like overall talent and potential they're more or less the same. Like, there's not really... Like, you can't say that, okay, Logan Brown is clearly a terrible player in comparison to Keller. It They just don't play the same way, but overall, you're talking about four forwards that will likely be top six players and three defensemen that will be likely top three defensemen. So... It's really just a pick of who's available and what your needs are. Yeah, and that's why picking at six and having our choice of these seven players might not be a bad idea to trade down, but we'll talk about that later. Um, the other thing I think about Nylander that makes him attractive to me is that he has played in the OHL. He's, I think, played at the highest level of the guys we've talked about so far. And the OHL is a good team or a good league. He played for Mississauga and got 75 points in 57 games last year plus playoffs. Um, so he's, you know, he's got some experience in North America on North American ice at a fairly high level. I think there's also something to be said about yeah. that. And another thing, because he was on loan from Europe, he can actually play in the AHL next season. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. So that's another added bonus if the Flames do go that route. Again, if the Flames picked Yost, they pick Keller, they pick Nylander, okay, I'm good. You're getting a good player regardless. So The thing about Nylander not... that might cause some pause with Brian Burke is he's not that physical. He doesn't have that Brian no. Burke truculence. Yeah. And again, I think outside of Sergachev and uh, Chikrin, I don't think that there's a physical player among the seven. So, you know, all the rest of the guys are passive guys anyway. So I don't think you're getting any raw physicality it's all all about skill with these seven well, we talked about the wingers let's move on to um let's move on to the defenseman and the first defenseman here is Oli jolivi jo yeah and he is a six foot two defenseman 183 pounds um plays plays this year in the uh london in the ohl for london he got 42 points. won the memorial cup 42 points, 57 regular games, and won the Memorial Cup. So a guy who's played a lot of hockey. We've had a lot of time to evaluate. He also played in the under-20 tournament. Uh, thoughts on Joe Levy? I think he's more of a Nick Lidstrom, Oli Mata, Jay Bomeister type of defenseman where not physical in any way, shape, or form relying instead on his smarts to get the job done. A good two-way defenseman, he can pass the puck up. I don't think his slap shot's any good at all, 
I don't think he'll score more than a handful of goals in any season in the NHL. But very much, all three of the defensemen are very much that style of Flames type of defenseman where good at rushing the puck up, good at pat making the stretch, stretch pass, good power play quarterback type guy. I've heard this guy compared to Oli Mata. Yeah. Um, both are good skaters. I think from what I've seen of Joe Levy, he has really good hockey sense and yeah. he really understands how to play defense. I mean, yeah, you're right. This guy's probably not the offensive defenseman of the future. I don't think every defenseman needs to be an offensive defenseman. I think this guy's a really good defensive defenseman. And, you know, I think it always works better if you compare an offensive guy with a defensive guy. And this is, I think, the guy who isn't going to get you in trouble on special teams. He's the guy that, you know, parks his butt at the blue line and can move that puck back up to his forwards. Yeah. Of the three defensemen, I have him ranked the lowest. Okay. And... I would take either of the other two over him. And why is that? Uh, I think that like while Jewel Levy's good uh, defensively and is probably the best of the three defensively, he's also the most incomplete package of the three. And I think the other two guys have more tools in their toolbox. Uh, actually, I think I would probably take Jewel Levy over Chikrin, but it... 50 50 split there okay but sergachev is the guy i would select if the flames are picking a defenseman well, let's look at sergachev then he's 17 he's six foot two and 220 pounds uh guy who's seen as a two-way defenseman he also played in the ohl this year getting 57 points in 67 regular season games and he was point per game in five playoff games with windsor this year um if you look at what scouts have said about Sergachev, he's a naturally fluid skater. He's always looking to be engaged. And he's generally part of, if not the biggest piece of pretty much every unfolding play. What do you think of yeah. Sergachev? He's a lot more dynamic than Jewel Levy. He's more in your face than him. Like, if you're comparing the defenders, like, Jewel Levy would be more of like a Jay Bomeister or Ole Mata type. Where Sergachev is more Mark Giordano. Can hit, can skate, can pass, can shoot the puck really well. He's the entire package of everything that you would want. He's not as good defensively right now as Dua Levy is. The Flames would have to be more patient with him if they're gonna select him than they would. Like, I don't think that he would be in the NHL next year. And to me, I think that's okay. I think that there's yeah. this... I, I think especially with rebuilding teams, there's this pressure that, oh, he got selected early. He got selected you know, in the top 30, if not the top 10. That means that he's NHL ready. And I think we've seen some players who've been rushed to the NHL and maybe shouldn't have. And this team doesn't need a, a great new face to sell tickets next year. You know, they're, no. not doing, they're not doing anything wrong in that department. So to me, if you need a guy... I mean, look at uh, last year with with Anderson and Shillington. We gave them both the time to develop in different leagues, but we gave them that time. And I think that if you need a, a guy to develop for a year or two, there's nothing wrong with that. He doesn't yeah. need to make the team just because he's drafted top 10. Yeah. And if you're looking at it, the Flames, one of the areas that they're lacking in is size on defense. And while Sergachev isn't tall, tall at 6'2", he is like 220 pounds. So you're getting a very solidly built player and, and is fast as well. It's not like he, he's being weighed down by the weight. It, he's very quick on his skates. So between the entire package, he, he would make an excellent number four defenseman on the Flames behind Giordano, Brody, and Hamilton. And, like, if you're imagining Anderson and Shillington making the team in a year or two, then, like, the top six would be all excellent players. So the Flames would be really overloading the team. But that would be a good thing. 
Yeah, and I think that if we look at the team overall, defense is where we're really lacking right now. So bringing in another guy who could become a top four defenseman wouldn't be a bad thing. Yeah, and if you look at Nashville, what they had ran into was they had six guys that were all really good, and they traded off Seth Jones, who's very good, to Columbus, and they got a first-line center in return. Now, the Flames, they're likely going to keep Giordano, Brody, and Hamilton if guys like Sergachev, if that's who we go with, and the other guys develop into NHL players, which they're looking like they're trending that way, then the Flames will have that same problem, and then you just can trade somebody, one of them, any of them, depends on what happens on the team for another area of need down the road because defensemen are always more in demand than forwards anyway and the flames will have guys coming up after that guys like hickey and all of that afterwards anyway so we'll have guys pushing for spots down the road anyway so you you're you would be having options and flexibility at that rate before we wrap up on the defenseman, I don't disagree with any of that. That's why I kind of said nothing. I think that if you look that Shillington or Anderson are going to make the NHL, probably one of them next season, if not the year after. Um, we really don't have any defensemen that stood out this year. I think that um, we had some guys like Kenny Morrison who took a bit of a step back. I wouldn't write them off yet. But I think that, I think that defense... We've got our top three NHL defensemen. We've got Brody, Hamilton, Geo. We're going to need a partner for Hamilton this year, which I think we can pick up as a UFA or a trade if we need to. I don't think you stick a young guy in your top four yet, at least none of those young guys. Yeah. And I think that I think that we need that constant role of players. So if we've got you know a Chikrin or a you know any of these guys that we're talking about, a Sergachev or a, a Joe Levy. Any of them could be that that young player who in a year or two goes to the HL and then pushes everybody else back up. So I think that any of these guys would be a good option there. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about Jacob Chikrin. He's 18. He's a defenseman again, six foot two, 198 pounds. Um, I've been watching some footage of this guy because he's. I find him interesting. I find he's really good at tracking the puck. You never see this guy have a puck go past him. You never see this guy, especially at the level he's playing, he seems like he's always able to to track that puck. And he seems to always be a step ahead of the opposition, too. If you watch his positioning, he knows how to use his stick and his body really well. And he's almost always forcing other teams to to make bad decisions quickly. Like He doesn't yeah. give them enough time to think through what they're doing. Um, In terms of raw tools... Chikrin of the three defensemen has the most tools in his toolbox and that's why for most of the season he was rated as the top guy and in a lot of ra ratings was fourth or fifth overall but the reason why he's dropped lately is he had a really disastrous under 18 tournament and calling into question his overall hockey IQ so that's why in more recent lists, like you've even seen him in the mid teens in the, the rankings, which I think is a little unfair, but there are some concerns that he may be like the next Cam Barker. So like, cause Barker had all the tools, but the toolbox, you know, they, he just didn't know how to use them properly. So that's the concern with him. And again, that's mostly due to that under-18 tournament because it was quite the disaster for him. Yeah, and, and every year you see that one bargain guy who drops because of an under-18 tournament or a playoff performance. But if you look at Chikrin, I mean, the rest of his resume is pretty solid. Oh, yeah. I'm not arguing. I think he has the most raw tools of any of the defensemen. And the last guy you had on your list here is uh, centerman, six foot six, Logan Brown. Uh, he plays another uh, OHL guy. He plays for the Windsor Spitfires. He's uh, 222 pounds. Tell us why you think that Brown would be a good uh, pick at, at sixth overall. 
Well, as you were mentioning before with Nylander, he does have bloodlines. His father, Jeff Brown, played many a year with the Vancouver Canucks and the St. Louis Blues. Uh, actually, I could see him going to the Canucks at number five because Lyndon and Jeff Brown were teammates for a number of years. And that familiarity may cross over and impact their decision making. Uh, very skilled player. Uh, sort of stylistically, he is very much similar to Joe Colborn. He is not a physical player yet, but in terms of raw talent, he is better than what Colborn was when he was drafted. Uh, he's not as good as what a player like Joe Thornton was when he was selected, but kind of in between those two extremes. So he could eventually develop into a first-line caliber center. More likely, he'll be a good second-line guy. See, the thing with Logan Brown to me, especially on the Flames team, if the new coach keeps sort of the flame style. I worry he's going to be sort of forced into being the big checker role. And I'm not sure that's the right role for him. No, I, I think that you would see him only get realistically be the second line center behind Monaghan and shifting Bennett to his wing. If the flames were to go that route, I don't see him being utilized properly if he's in a third or fourth line role. And I think that for a second line centerman or a second line player of any kind, using this sixth overall pick to pick him up when I think every player we've mentioned so far has probably more potential than uh, Brown, I don't think I'd do it at, at six. No. And that's why between six and 12... There's not really a huge separation between any of them, so if the Flames are picking at 6, I think the best thing that the Flames could do is actually trade down. Yeah? Because if you're looking at all the teams, there's likely... If, say, the Flames trade down to 9 or 10, one of the teams is going to take Nylander, one of the teams is going to take at least one of the defensemen, and probably one team will take one of, or take Logan Brown, because as six foot six center, they don't grow on trees. So at that rate, you're going to take, have your options of one of the other two small wingers, who are both pretty much equally talented as Nylander. I actually think Keller is better than Nylander, but that's my own thought. And you're going to get one of either Jewel Levy, Sergachev, or Chikrin available, or two of them. So, there's not really any separation between any of these players, really. Like, for what uh, lack of skill that Brown has, he makes up for by being huge, where the other forwards are not that big. I think it would make more sense to trade down allow some of the names to get crossed off the list and then pick the best of the rest while adding like a second round pick and something else. And why how, not? How far would you comfortably feel trading down? Nine or 10. Okay. I wouldn't want to go to like, I know there's some teams that 13 and 14 who have a second first round pick. I would not be comfortable trading down that far. But, again, uh, it depends. Yeah, uh, I would agree. I don't want to get out of the top 10 in this draft. I think if you get out of the top 10 in this draft, you're not going to get the quality of player that you want in a first-round pick for a rebuilding team. I think, in yeah. my mind, this team is still rebuilding. Um, and we need that... I don't want to say yeah, top-level well, player because none of these guys are going to be elite, elite players, but I think they can all be good players for what we need at this point. And yeah. I, I, well, it also depends because like, you also have two other defensemen uh, that we didn't mention, Jake Bean, who played with the Hitmen, and Charlie McAvoy, who played for Boston University in the NCAA. 
and they're not far behind Jewel Evian, Sergachev, or Chikrin. So a team might like one of those two guys over those three. And, like, if the Flames, say, traded down to nine and one of the teams above them took one of those two defensemen, it may make some sense to trade down again a little bit at that point. It would depend, it depend largely on what happens on the draft floor, but, again, options are available at that point. So if you're Treliving... Number six is called, and you've decided to use it. Um, who would you draft at number six? Without question, Clayton Keller. You think he's the best of all those guys? Yep. And why? Top potential, top everything. So why do you think he's so much above everybody else? Uh, I think he has the highest offensive potential of anybody, and with having a similar player in Gaudreau, if you're having two of them, especially in the end of the game, uh, say the Flames need a goal to tie the game, having two very creative, very high IQ players on the ice at the same time, they'll be able to figure out options that might not be apparent to other players, and you're more likely to see a goal resulting from them playing on the ice at the same time. And it also gives you the option of switching up the lines if things aren't working. Like, you can switch Gaudreau with Keller type of thing. And I think that Keller does have the potential to be a 70-80 point player like Gaudreau. Where I don't think either Yost or Nylander or Brown have that high of an upside. I think they're more 60-point players. Okay. So, yeah. that, for me, I you know, with the first-round pick, I'm wanting the guy who will make the absolute biggest impact, and I think Keller is the guy that will make the absolute biggest impact. All right, so now let's put it this way. Um, you go up to the... It, you're called, you're on the clock at 6. Would you take Keller... Or would you, let's say you had the option to trade down to 9 or 10. Do you do that instead? Trade down. Trade down, and you think you could probably get Logan Brown still? I, or would you take somebody for else me, at that point? For me, the order that I would go would be Keller, Sergachev, Nylander, Yost, then Brown. So it would depend on which of those names are crossed off, and I would just take the highest of whosoever's left. Okay. Interesting. For me, I think I would, if I'm drafting at number six, I would take Nylander. I think Keller would be my second choice if I want to take a forward, but I think for me, I'd go Nylander first and then uh, Chikrin. I think that I like Nylander as a player. I think we could use a defenseman, so I'd go with one of those guys. I don't think I'd trade down with the amount of talent we'll probably have available unless somebody goes totally off the board in one to five, in which case grab whoever they left. But um, I think that unless you're getting a really good deal, I mean, we've got enough picks as it is, unless you're getting a really good deal, I'd just draft at six and take one of those two. Yeah. The uh, only reason why I would trade down to get, say, 39 or 40, the, that pick, uh, is due to the likelihood that the Flames will trade number 35. Yeah, I think that the second round pick, ours, will be used to acquire a goaltender. But that's the main reason why I would be willing to trade down. I think in, the, in a draft like this, if I'm going to trade down, I'd almost rather trade down for a future year. That is also a possibility. Because there's but just not I a lot of good talent outside that top 30. Yeah. Well, there are a few options available at 35 or 39. But even in even in the second round, I mean, you get rid of, say, 30. Let's say you, you trade the first round pick, you trade down. Now you've got 35, let's say 40, 54, and 56. I think if you're going to make a trade, you almost try to move one of the 54 or 56 picks. Yeah, uh, but it also gives you other options. Like, say, um, Julian Gauthier falls down to say 23 or 24 you might be able to package one of the late and one of the early picks to second round picks to get that 
and move up. So it there's a lot of it just gives you a lot more options and it depends on like if one through five go one through five, then obviously To me there's no question those guys go top five. What about yeah. you? But if somebody's say Edmonton's stupid it which wouldn't surprise me and they take say Jewel Levy because they need a defenseman well, then you don't trade number six and you just take whichever of the two guys, Kachuk or Dubois, that fall to you. Yeah, I think if number six is dealt, it's going to be a on-the-floor, right-before-the-pick type move. It's not going to yeah. be something we hear about the morning of or no. you know, right after the first. I think you're right. you got to keep number six to keep your options open. And as soon as you know what player is available, because you're right, if somebody goes off the board, you take whoever's left. I mean, Kachuk, yeah. I think, would be great here. Um, yeah, exactly. Like if Dubois or Kachuk fall to six, well, you're just getting one of the top five guys in the draft, and you don't even question that. And you would hate to have traded that pick away and then lose exactly. that opportunity. And like you would be phoning both Vancouver and Edmonton to see like exact because you will know exactly what they're gonna do. So that way you can say build what your concept is if you're say wanting to trade down to number nine you'd have that deal in place so okay if the oilers are picking kachuk and the canucks are picking dubois then okay i will pull the trigger on this deal six to nine for 30 you know and 39 that kind of a thing like you'd have that if a and b happen then we'll do this if you know the oilers go off the board and take a defenseman then that changes the whole calculus entirely yeah no that's very true and again that wouldn't happen until like five minutes before you go to pick well i don't so. even i don't even know about five minutes i think that's going to be within you know like you're yeah you're on the clock right away i think that's a deal that would be made done as yeah like and store. canucks take dubois then Batman goes over, well, we have a trade to announce. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think that's one thing you get done. You have it sort of in your back pocket, if you will. And all of a sudden it just becomes, okay, this is what we're going to do. Let's go do it. And you've already got the team agreeing with you. So I think that it's, I, I don't think the Flames will trade down. I can see why they might. But I personally can't, I can't see them doing it with the, with the talent that's on the board. Yeah. And realistically, the only way I see them, like, the likeliest scenario is if 35 and one of the other picks is gone due to trading for, like, Marc-Andre Fleury or something. You know, I could see them, okay, well, we got rid of our good second round pick, let's try and get another one back. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. I don't... It just depends. Like, everything. Yeah, I don't think it'll happen, but yeah, I could maybe see that happening. Yeah. So, we'll see. And, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that after last year, with the Flames having having traded their first round pick, I think that there's going to be a little bit more of a... I, I want to think of the best way to say this. A little bit more of a desire to uh, to keep that pick. I yeah. think there's going to be a little bit more of a desire to keep that pick, to hang on to that pick, and to make the pick. Because I think that they got some flack last year for trading that pick. Yeah. And I can agree with that. It's just uh, this particular year's draft is a little bit weird where you're, you've are you basically got seven players that are basically the same in terms of potential. So, like, normally there's a clear either you're picking this guy or you're picking that guy at six or seven type of thing and then there's a drop off but this year it seems like from six to twelve there's not really a huge separation between any of them so that's why uh, trading down is a little more likely this year yeah it's not likely but it's and, I, and to be fair, I'm not saying that last year the Flames shouldn't have, tra have traded the first. I thought they made a good move. But I yeah, know so that, do I. But I know that there were a lot of people that thought, hmm, maybe this wasn't the best, necessarily the best thing to do. Yeah. But six foot five right shooting defensemen that are 21 and have 40 points in the NHL do not grow on trees. So 
No, for sure they don't. So, like, I would have much, you know, I would have liked to have gotten uh, uh, Kyle Connor, who that's who the Flames were likely going to pick. But, you know, who knew that he would fall, A, and B, getting Hamilton, I would easily trade Connor for Brant, or Hamilton, so because defensemen that are that big do not grow on trees. Well, so. and I think too often, and you know, I know what you're saying, but I think too often we put too much emphasis on size. True. Size of defensemen. And yes, it's nice to have a big defenseman, but you can have a big defenseman who's still terrible. True. Um, so I think that, yeah, the size was important for sure. Don't get me wrong. But I think that, you know, we saw Hamilton have a bit of a rocky start here, but I think overall it was the right move to make. Oh, yeah. It's not like uh, the trade that Edmonton made right after for Griffin Reinhardt. No. Now, that was a stupid trade. Yeah, and I think that, you know, I mean, we could debate it, but I think that with Edmonton, there was a bit of a a Me Too thing coming in there. You know, we didn't get the guy we wanted, so let's go out and make, you know, another trade. And I think they might have been trying to prove something to their fans or themselves there. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Anyway... Matt, uh, that wraps up the first round of draft picks tonight. Yep. Um, that is really all we have to talk about for round one is those guys because we only have the one pick this year. Yeah. But we And will... we can't really say that, oh, we're going to be picking at 22 or something because we don't have that pick yet, so we can't really talk about that. <laughs> no, for sure we can't. Um, and realistically, if the Flames were to use multiple seconds to trade up, the likeliest target would be Julian Gauthier. You think so? Yeah. Well, six foot four right winger, that's a scorer. I think that would be the likeliest if the Flames are going to trade up. Oh. None of the other guys are really that good. Yeah, you could be right. You could be right. Um,. I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of Gautier. Neither am I. I think you're probably right in that, yeah, if they were going to trade up, that's who they'd go to. I'm not a fan of his, but, yeah, who knows. Yeah. I I, th mm. I think that you might see some teams do some interesting things this year just because the draft isn't as deep. Yeah. I think you might see guys trading up or moving for players who they wouldn't have normally yeah, well, like, Minnesota apparently is willing to trade 15 for uh, a decent young player that can play next year. So uh, that's not really a high bar for a mid-round, first-round pick, so. No. So, well, that wraps up our first-round preview. We'll be back next week um, with our previews of round two and lower. Yep. Gotta get through it all, so yeah. it's all good. So if you want to hear the rest of this, tune in again next week for our next draft episode, and that should pretty much take us right to the entry draft. Yep, and then we'll have another show afterwards recapping the draft and all that fun stuff. So Yeah, and then we get into unrestricted free agency right after that. And development camp on July 4th, so... All the important things. Yep. Uh, lots coming in the next couple of weeks and then we're off for the summer again and looking forward to training camp. And before we go, I just want to remind everybody to take our listener survey. This is a survey we have online. Um, it only takes about 10 to 15 minutes of your time, so not much at all. But this really helps us learn more about you. Not so much you as a person, but you as a listener. What do you want to hear? What do you like? Do you think the show's a good length? Do you want it to be longer, shorter? Are there segments you like that we do? Are there things you want us to add? If you can take the survey, it's at www.firesidechat.ca slash survey. Take it. Um, if you want to, you don't have to, but on the end of the survey, there's a place where you can enter your name and email address. If you do, you'll be entered to win a Fireside Chat and Flames prize pack. We got some Flames stuff, some Fireside Chat stuff. We'll box up and send it to you if you win. It's just a random draw. Otherwise, if you don't want that, you can still take the survey. Just don't enter your name at the end. But we want to hear from you. We're doing the show for you guys. We want to make sure that whatever it is you know, you want to hear, we know that and we can try to incorporate it in the show. So firesidechat.ca slash survey. 
Well, Matt, we'll talk to you next week. Take care. Thanks for listening, everyone. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.